Well, good morning, Mount Gilead. If you stand with us today, we're going to start off the new year right. We're going to worship our God, sing his praise. So sing along with Glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Oh, yes, I'm
Amen. Woo! What a great way to start out 2024. Can we give our, our baptism uh, just a hand, of, a round of applause? What amazing... <laughs> Nothing like starting off right, the new year with new life. We believe our God is doing that each and every Sunday that we show up. He shows up. His presence is here waiting for you when you come in this place. And whether this is your first Sunday here, and maybe this is all a little new, but I can promise you that God has got a word for you, and we are so glad that you've joined us today. Maybe 2024, your resolution was to make it to church every Sunday. Maybe some of that's, that's you. That would be an amazing resolution to make in your life, because I know God wants to do something in each and every one of us in 2024. We believe, we're believing God for really great things this coming year. To start out this year, what we want to do is we just want to speak the name of Jesus over every circumstance, over everything, moving forward from this day forward to the end of the year. We just want to open up and sing our praise and speak the name of Jesus over everything. Don't you agree that's the best way that I think we could start this new year on this Sunday is to declare the name of Jesus over our life, over our future, over our circumstances, and everything he wants to do in our heart to be open to whatever the Lord has for us this year. So let's do that together. I just wanna invite you wherever you are. You can worship with us, you can sing with us. The words will be on the screen. You can just bow your head and just let the Lord speak to you today. But we just wanna move in this direction and, and just speak the name of Jesus over this year and over our life, over our families, and whatever he wants to do. So let's do that together.
is what we want at this church. We want the name of Jesus to be spoken. We want the name of Jesus to be lifted higher than any other name. That is our hope, that is our prayer. Isn't that what you want this morning? Go ahead and have a seat. I remember when I was a kid, when we got to this point in our service at, the, at communion time, there was this really big table right down front, right in front of the stage right at the base of the center aisle. And on that table, it was a beautiful table. Uh, there was a, there were a couple of plates there. There was one plate with a little bit of broken bread and a second plate had some cups of juice filled and ready to go. And then on the front of the table, it had these words etched on the wood, do this in remembrance, yeah, of me. Do what? Well, we're about to share in a simple meal, powerful meal, but a simple meal, a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice that reminds us of Jesus' body and of his blood. But in remembrance of what? Well, of course, there are a lot of things that we could remember about Jesus this morning. We, we can remember that he came to live and love and teach and heal. But in this moment specifically, we are remembering that he came to die, that he came to lay down his life, pay the penalty for our sin. And that's what we remember at this time. We have broken bread and we have poured wine, body and blood. And we do this, we eat this in remembrance of that, in remembrance of him. And we proclaim his death together until he comes again. Would you pray with me? Father, once again, we come before you and at this moment, we choose to remember. And in particular, Father, we remember the death of your son, Jesus, who did so many great things in his 30 some years of life, all culminating in his death and his burial. And then we cannot forget also his resurrection. But we understand today there is no resurrection without a death. And so we're thankful for that in this moment. We're thankful that he died so that we could live in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Justin, and I'm the recovery minister here at Mount Gilead. So glad that you made it. Here we are, the very first Sunday of the year. Glad you chose to start off the year uh, with us. And especially if this happens to be your very first time with us today, uh, we, we know every Sunday we meet, it's somebody's very first time here. And so if that happens to be you today, we want to say a special welcome to you. Hope you keep coming back. In fact, we've got something right through those doors right after service today. If you want to stop by there, it's a place called Guest Central, a little teal uh, desk. We have a small gift for you. And if you have any questions about Mount Gilead or want to find out how you can plug in further, we'd love to uh, answer those questions for you and get to know you a little bit out there. Uh, obviously, uh, the whole uh, 2023 was an amazing year for us, but in particular, last month, December, was a pretty great, year, pretty great month for us. A lot of great things happened in the walls, inside the walls of this building, uh, and also outside the walls in our community for the name of Jesus. But one of the most important things that happened was that several people gave their lives to Jesus, accepted what he did for them, were baptized uh, over the last 30 days. We've got a couple of slides to show who that was. There we go. Let's hear it for Cassie and DJ, Isaac, Kimberly, Mike, Colin, Brian, and Hunter. Amazing. We have two more, obviously, that we just got to witness this morning. And you might be thinking, man, I, I've been thinking about this too, and I just haven't done it. No need to delay. If, if, if you're looking to make that decision as well, uh, just see one of us in the lobby afterwards. Our, our emails are on the church website. You can contact us this week and we can set a time to talk about that. You can always, at the end of the service, head over to door F afterwards. Somebody will be there to help you know how you can make that, uh, that decision as well. Students, special day for you. First of all, we have launched a new student hangout on Sunday morning out in the youth lobby. Uh, it's through the, the, the doors of the main lobby towards the gym. If you go that direction, you'll see it over there. I heard rumblings that they had donuts there this morning. And so if you're a middle school student or a high school student, uh, head on over there at some point, get some information about what we're doing with our student ministry. It actually relaunches tonight after a brief holiday break. And uh, if you're a, if you're a student, we'd love to have you join us as things kick off once again. Speaking of kickoffs, uh, we also, in the month of January, are relaunching three of our care groups. We, uh, we try to do what we can as a church to really address real life issues. And so on Monday, January 22nd, we're launching our next round of Grief Share. If you have lost someone that you love in the last year and you're kind of struggling with that and needing to rebuild and, and want to connect with some other people who are trying to deal with, uh, with their grief, that'd be a great opportunity for you. You can go to the website and sign up for that. That's Monday, January 22nd. Then the next day... Tuesday, January 23rd, we're launching Divorce Care. Some of you know what it's like to deal with the pains of divorce and are still wanting to work through all of that and all the layers that come with that. We wanna help you as a church. And uh, so we've got a great uh, leadership group that will be leading that on Tuesday, January 23rd. Again, if you can, let us know that you're gonna be there ahead of time by, by registering on the website. And then tomorrow night, as we've been telling you, we, we restart our uh, recovery group called Connections. This year, I'm so excited, this year we are starting a brand new series called Begin Again. And the idea is maybe, maybe you are struggling with an addiction with drugs or alcohol or pornography or gambling or food. Maybe you say, well, I'm not really an addict, but I just kind of feel stuck, like I'm missing something and I wanna figure out how to regain purpose and meaning to my life. I wanna be fulfilled in my life. Come join us tomorrow night, seven o'clock. We're gonna start right here. I'll be here. We're gonna start the series. It's gonna be a great opportunity to grow and to focus on the future and to get excited about where the Lord is leading us in our lives. And you'll get to connect with a lot of other people who are trying to do the same thing. So give it a shot tomorrow night, seven o'clock, enter door eight. Okay, this is also the time in our service where we worship through giving. And so if you're at a place you'd like to financially contribute to the work of the kingdom happening here at Mount Gilead, there are three ways to do that. You can go online to our website, you can use the Mount Gilead app, or you can find the giving boxes throughout the building. So excited, Jeff's starting a new series for us this morning. It's gonna be a great series over the next several weeks. Let's pray, and then he'll come up. Father, once again, we thank you for who you are and for what you're doing in our lives and all over creation, that you are in control, Lord, 
You are the master, your son, Jesus. He is our king, and we surrender our lives to him once again. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with your people, and now thank you for the opportunity to open your word and hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Second Service. Congratulations are in order. Because if you are here in this room with us today, right now, you have perfect attendance for 2024. So congratulations. Never mind the resolutions that you may have already broken in the last six days. Never mind how many times you wrote 2023 instead of 2024. Right now, you have perfect attendance for 2024, so I salute you. And as we welcome 2024, could we just take a minute? We'd be remiss if we didn't to acknowledge what God has done for and through Mount Gilead in 2023. I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, Best of all, 239 baptisms in 2023. Yes. A 25, a 25% in attendance uh, increase, 27% in our children's ministry, a highest gener- generosity level in our history with a whole bunch of new participants in that, expanding missions partnerships near and far. Uh, we launched that, that next phase of our uh, building project. The, the shell is already there on this side of the building, and they're working uh, each week inside of that. Probably should be finished sometime in uh, March or something like that. We have scores of uh, first-time guests. Or we had a walk with me focus on discipleship, expanding recovery ministry. We got the wonderful surprise of a National Bible Bowl championship. We've got young people who are preparing for ministry uh, education. Uh, Maybe best of all, we have hundreds of life change stories. And then some of you may be wondering about our special offering in December. We had a goal of $500,000 for the offering in December. And uh, it's my privilege to tell you that though there are still some things being calculated right now, we are at $643,000 thousand dollars for the month of December. And so some really good things are going to happen as a result of that. And consequently, um, we have high expectations for what God will do in 2024. And those expectations are not about just numbers and statistics. What does Mount Gilead need to be and do in 2024? And by the way, as as we think about that, Mount Gilead, MG, Mount Gilead is you. So what do you need to be, to become, and do in 2024? Maybe you've heard this before, but every single follower of Jesus, every believer in Christ has five outlets of spiritual power. That is five ways that we impact people, we impact the world, we impact the kingdom, we impact our community, we impact our family, we impact our workplace, and we impact the planet with spiritual power. Five ways we do that. Five ways to make a difference. Five ways to dispense the power of God. And you need to tune in because you and I are going to need this in a changing world in 2024. And I know of no other ways than these five ways to impact our world through the power of Jesus. And I first heard about this years ago, decades ago, from a radio preacher. His name was M.R. Dahan. And over the years, I've mentioned this uh, many times, and I hope to mention it many times in the future, because these are the five ways that God's power can flow through you. Here they are. What I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. What I am, what I say, what I do, 
what I give, and what I pray. What I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. That's how God's power flows through us. And I want you to understand, we're gonna spend some time on each one of these in the next few weeks, but I want you to understand, these are not New Year's resolutions. We know what happens to those. This is not a checklist or a to-do list. And these cannot be accomplished by mere uh, determination and resolve or self-discipline, though we may utilize those things in our expressions of spiritual power. No, what I am talking about today is the real power of God in you and the real power of God in me. And we have kind of a key phrase for all this. It comes from Colossians chapter one, the second part of verse 27. It speaks of the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, let that phrase burn in your mind. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's our, the only hope is Christ. Christ in you is the only hope of glory. Or we could say it like John says it in 1 John 4, 4, another famous verse. You, dear children of God, have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And an even more famous verse, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. His powers at work within us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And one that gets overlooked sometimes. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine yourselves. It's a good New Year's activity right here. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless you fail the test. What I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. But it's all dependent on Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we're gonna take those five things. We're gonna start with the first one today, what I am or who I am, and all the rest of it springs out of this, and this springs out of Jesus in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What and who you are springs from whose you are, your identity in Christ. Now, when I say that word identity, we all know identity is a big deal, right? It's a big word in our culture. When it comes to identity, some people focus on racial, ethnic, or national identity. There are others who are consumed with sexual or gender identity. And certainly there are those who emphasize economic identity and professional identity and cultural identity and social identity and religious identity. And with all the furor over people and politics and passions and pride and power and perceptions and, and pronouns, identity always seems to be an issue. And it's become an unceasing source of confusion and division with increasingly heated identity battles. So it's necessary for us to lay a little bit of an identity foundation today for lifelong disciples of Jesus. And we'll just start with this simple truth that no aspect of our identity can compare with our primary identity in Christ. If you are a Jesus follower today, if you are a believer in Christ, there is no aspect of who you are, there is no aspect of your identity that can compare to that primary identity in Christ. I've been known different ways throughout my life. There was a time when I was known primarily as the oldest son of George and Laura Fall. There's a time when I was known, believe it or not, as the skinny kid with an afro. It's true. I've been known as Mount Gilead's preacher. I've been known as Valerie's husband. I've been known as Austin, Lindsay, and Trey's dad. An American. Right now, I'm known as a G-Paw with grandkids. And then there are all my, what I'll call, attempted identities. How I want people to see me. I want to be known as, and we all have those, don't we? Just take a look at our social media posturing. And sometimes our identities are lies because the reality of our identity doesn't match our wishes. Some of them are just downright impossible, even though prevailing culture and society insists otherwise. But the truth is, you are a body 
soul, and spirit. You are mind and heart. You are a human being made in the image of God. But if you are a believer, a follower of Jesus, you are a child of God in a special way with all that goes with that identity in Christ. And that changes everything about who I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. Everything because of that identity. Elsewhere, Paul says it this way, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So let me say it again. No aspect of our identity can compare to our primary identity in Christ. At the same time, it's true that we don't have to ignore our lesser identities. Think about Paul. He referred to himself with many descriptors of his identity. He spoke of his Hebrew heritage. He flashed his Roman citizenship card whenever it was necessary. On several occasions, he displayed his extensive resume and credentials. He called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. He even told us about his marital status. He appealed to the fact that he was an old man, Paul the aged. He enumerated his many experiences and visions. He even spoke of his physical limitations in regard to his past. He called himself a sinner, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. And certainly it's true that we who follow Christ should never glory in any identity that is untrue, immoral, unwholesome, or contrary to God's clearly stated purpose and will or one that's intended to demean others or promote hatred or self-righteousness. Paul openly shared multiple aspects of his personal identity, but his intention every time he did it in revealing and even leveraging those realities always served the purpose of furthering his primary identity in Christ. So as believers, it's completely uh, possible for us to describe the different facets of who we are as well. I'm a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm an American. And many other things that can be good and wholesome. But even when they're important, none of those things supersede our primary identity in Christ. Because our real identity grows and flows from healthy relationships in Christ. Long time ago, somebody suggested to me that if you want to know the theme of any of the New Testament letters, any of the the books in the New Testament, you could generally find it by looking through that letter for the words in Christ. And you find those words in Christ, in context, in any book of the New Testament, and you understand what flows out of that, you'll probably find the theme of that book. When we consider who we are in Christ, when we passionately seek him and his will, we gain clarity concerning our own identity and helping others to find theirs. And out of that identity flows what I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. Now, how about a short example of this from someone who changed in all five of these areas when Jesus came in? And you'll see very quickly why I call it a short example. Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through and a a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And, And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, here and now, uh, underline that, here and now, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save 
the loss. Now, think of it this way. What I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. Think of those five things in the life of Zacchaeus. And think in terms of before and after. First, what I am. You ask Zacchaeus, what are you? He's a sinner. He's a thief. He's a tax collector. He's not just a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. He's wealthy. He's short. And he's lost. And then he meets Jesus. And he's saved. And he's a son of Abraham. And he's changed. And he's a friend and a host of Jesus. And he's still short. What I am. You say, what about what he said? Well, before, Zacchaeus said, you owe me. You pay me. I take from you. I'm the chief tax collector. After, I give. I make it right. I change. What I do? Before, I steal. I intimidate. I serve myself. I don't care. After, I give. I make it right. I change. What I pray? Before, I pray nothing. I don't care about things like that. After, Lord. He calls Jesus Lord. Look. Welcome. I'll do whatever you ask. What I give? <laughs> what a tax collector gives? Before, zip. Zero. Nada. I don't give. I collect. After, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. If I've stolen anything from anybody, I'm going to pay it back four times over. And I'm going to open up my home gladly for Jesus to come in. What I am, what I say, what I do, what I give, and what I pray. It all changed. And remember the wording, here and now, Lord, here and now, I give half of what I have to the poor. And you can take any character from the New Testament that met Jesus about whom we have enough information and see the same kind of story. Whether it's Zacchaeus or blind Bartimaeus who was healed on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem or, or Mary Magdalene or the Gadarene demoniac who had a legion of demons or Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul or John the Hater who became John the Apostle of Love or the women who followed Jesus and supported his ministry or the Twelve or the fishermen. Your identity and your essence and your being and your character and your soul and your inner self and your core and your nature and your substance and your makeup can flow out of a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it would be helpful to think of it this way. We have five senses, right? See, hear, taste, touch, and smell. A couple years ago, a popular magazine carried a self-test. How sensitive are you, they asked. And according to the article, if your senses are working normally, if they're at their optimum level, you can feel. You can feel on your fingertips or face the pressure that depresses your skin a bare four one hundred thousandths of an inch. You could feel the weight of a bee's wing falling on your cheek from less than a half an inch away. You can see. You could see a candle flame from 30 miles away on a clear dark night. You can distinguish among more than 300,000 different variations of color. And when your olfactory senses are working correctly, you could smell one drop of perfume diffused through a three-room apartment. And when your taste buds are working right, 0.04 of an ounce of table salt dissolved in 530 quarts of water, you could taste it. And when you hear correctly, you can gauge the direction of a sound's origin based on three one hundred thousandths of a second difference in the arrival of the sound from one ear to the other. You say, well, right, not anymore. Unfortunately, those senses can diminish as we age. In fact, listen to one of the best aging descriptions that I know. It comes from King Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember the Creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. And listen how he describes the aging process. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the 
the grinders cease because they are so few. When those who look through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of the grinding fades and people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms, that's the hair turning white, and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred. I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about in the street. You can find all five of your senses there. The only one I couldn't find there was the sense of smell. But when all the rest of that stuff happened to you, it stinks real bad when you're getting old, right? Because the truth is, as we age, our senses gradually decline. But the opposite is true spiritually. As we mature in Christ, regardless of our physical age, our spiritual senses can sharpen. And we do have five spiritual senses. I I love how authors Leonard Sweet and Frank Viola put it. When you were born again, you were given five new senses. A new sense of sight, a new sense of taste, a new sense of hearing, a new sense of touch, and a new sense of smell. And there are verses to go along with each one of those that I don't have time to read right now. But if your spiritual senses are working correctly, you will hear God's voice and you will feel his touch and you will see his glory and you will smell his fragrance and you will taste his goodness. And so the question becomes again, how sensitive to spiritual things are you? Because you don't just hear, you listen to hear his slightest whisper. You don't just see, you you gaze on his beauty. Uh, Tim Keller once said, religious people find God useful, but Christians find God beautiful. You don't just touch, you feel. You don't just taste, you, you savor. You don't just catch the scent. You inhale and bask in the aroma and engage the spiritual senses and you, you discern. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter five, anybody who lives on milks, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You can taste what is good and you can taste what is evil. Because it's been said that 90 to 95% of the decisions that you and I make, they're not premeditated. They just spill over and out from what's inside of us. They spill out from what we have habitually fed and practiced and, and cultivated. And if we are focused on Christ in us, the hope of glory, then the fruit grows from within. I was thinking about this week, um, you know, on Christmas Eve morning, we didn't have services here. I think that's like, I've been here for, this is my 36th year. I don't ever remember that happening. We didn't have services on Sunday morning. So that morning, I got up at 5 a.m. at daily Bible and prayer time and coffee. And I took a two-mile outdoor nature walk. Came back in, had coffee with my wife, Val. Then we turned on the computer and watched online, watched my son-in-law preach and my daughter sing in Louisville, Kentucky. Then we went to another online service and we watched my son preach and my daughter-in-law sing in Massachusetts. Then we had some more coffee. And then we had lunch. And I went over my sermon in the afternoon and I sat around a little bit and I'm thinking... I could get used to this. <laughs> see, see, the reality for me, the result for me personally from that day is that schedule change gave me the opportunity to have a prayer and private scripture time with God. It gave me time to, as they say, commune with God in nature. It allowed me to experience two online services. It gave me family time and prep time. It did all those things that morning. But something didn't feel quite right. And no, it's not because we didn't have morning church. I hope nobody got bent out of shape about that. If they did, I didn't, I didn't hear about it. You know, the verse in Scripture that tells us they met on Sunday, they met on the first day of the week to break bread. In that particular verse, they met in the evening. In fact, they met in the evening, and Paul preached till midnight, and some guy got so tired he fell out the window and died. So there's that. 
There was nothing wrong with that we had church on Sunday night instead of Sunday morning. So if that's been bugging you, man, throw that one out of your theology bin, all right? So why did I feel unfulfilled and incomplete? I heard two sermons. I watched two services. I walked two miles in nature. I drank two gallons of coffee. I mean, what did I need? What was missing? What is it that wasn't quite right? What's missing? You. Us. Being present with each other. Face to face in in community together. Seeing God together, hearing from God together, tasting his grace together, reaching out to touch God together and to touch each other, inhaling, sensing his presence and the aroma of God together. That's why this whole thing in 2024, what I am, what I say, what I do, what I give and what I pray calls for community together because all of it flows into who we are in Christ and all of it flows out of who we are in Christ and it's all together. Scripture says, without him, I can do nothing and that's true. But I can do all things through God who strengthens me. So without him, I can do nothing. Without you, I could do a lot less. Without each other, we cannot accomplish our our full potential. That's why Colossians 1, which we started with, says the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then listen to what he says. He, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy that God so powerfully works in me. I mean, that's got to be a Mount Gilead scripture, right? Right? Everyone mature in Christ. Lifelong disciples. Everyone mature in Christ. That should be all of us. The energy that Christ works in us should help us to mature in Christ and help us to help other people mature in Christ. The hope of glory is Christ in us, making us who we are and powerfully working in us. And that doesn't stop Paul from saying, I strenuously contend. And that's where we need to go in 2024. All of us moving toward maturity in Christ. It's for everybody that calls Mount Gilead home or for those who will call Mount Gilead home, who are considering calling Mount Gilead home. And that's why for some time now, we've been doing some work on what we call our member expectations, what it means to be a member of the Mount Gilead family. And this is vital for multiple reasons, but especially for two things. And those two things are care and accountability. Care and accountability. How do we care for each other? And how do we hold each other accountable for growth? What, what do we believe together? What truths unite us? And, and what and who are we becoming as a church? And how do we move forward together toward lifelong maturity as followers of King Jesus? I'll just tell you the truth. I I haven't met a church yet that completely gets this right. Certainly not this one. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strenuously contend for it. It doesn't mean that that shouldn't be our goal, to present everyone mature in Christ. And that flows through who we are, what we say, what we do, what we give, and what we pray. So starting next Sunday, for the next five weeks, we're going to host what we just call a member connect. And every Sunday in each service, The early and the late service will host a member connect experience in another part of the building. And we're going to offer them both services. We're going to limit the number of people in each session. And we're going to walk through a description of member expectations and a unifying statement of important beliefs and positions for Mount Gilead. It's a simple one-week ask. 
a one-week commitment so that we can level set as many people as possible with what it means to be a member at Mount Gilead. And by the way, it's for anyone who cares about membership here, even if you've been a member for 40 years or if you're brand new. There's a sign up on the app that is live right now. You can go in and I encourage you to do that today. Choose the session that works for you. And if you're one of those people who says, what's an app? Or I can't find an app. You can stop out at the event hub in the lobby and somebody will help you do that. And if all the sessions fill up, we'll just offer more. We want to get everyone aligned and on the same page to start off 2024 right. And there's not a person in here that that leaves out. Because some of us here just need to brush up on what it means to be a member of Christ's family. And some of us here kind of left that behind a long time ago and we need to re-up and recommit. And some of us here need to sign up for the first time. So whether you just need to brush up or sign up or re-up, this member connect is for you. Imagine what can happen when we all get on the same page and we're all thinking the same thing and we want to present everyone fully mature in Christ. I, I could guarantee you that standing here at this time next year, if we all did that, would be way more exciting than some numbers. And I'm not diminishing those numbers in any way. I'm simply saying that if we want to fulfill God's vision for Mount Gilead, we can't stay on the sidelines. I, the one thing I've learned in life is I can't make anybody do anything. Sometimes I can't even make me do things. But you don't want to stay on the sidelines for this because it's going to take all of us engaged in a line to fulfill God's vision for this church so that at this time next year, we can stand back and say, look what God has done. We thought 2023 was great. Look what God has done in 2024. There's a member of this church here. Um, in fact, he's sitting here today. His name is uh, Johnny Vaught. He was an Air Force colonel. We call him the colonel sometimes. And he'd been here for years, decades. And one day recently after church, I walked down from the stage and I caught him right, right here in this area. And he said, uh, Jeff, how long have you known me? I said, Johnny, I, I don't know. Um, 25 years? He said, in those, in those 25 years, have I ever complained about anything? I thought, oh, brother, here it goes. I mean, don't, don't do that to me before the service. Do that to me after the service, okay? Have I ever complained? 25 years, have I ever complained about anything? And I said, no, Johnny, I, I don't believe you have. have. Have I ever asked for anything? No, I, Johnny, I, I, I don't think you have. And he said, well... I got a complaint. I said, all right, hit me with it. He said, the doors on the west side of the building, I'm coming in there the other day. And he said, I, as I come up to those glass doors, I can see my reflection in the doors. And there's something wrong with those doors because it made me look like I was a fat old man. And you need to do something about that. <laughs> what if... What if today you go home and you look at yourself in the mirror? You don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and then talked to the person staring back at you? I have. What if you went home today and you looked at yourself in the mirror and you talked to that person that's staring back at you and you said, who are you? I mean, who are you really? What do you want to be? Who are you becoming? What needs to happen as a result of Christ in you? Don't you realize, Paul said, that Jesus Christ is in you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a better way to start a new year than make a list of a bunch of things that you might just drop anyway. Start the new year off right this time in Christ. And as Justin mentioned earlier, you can do that even today, right back there, door F. There's somebody uh, waiting there to talk with you. And on this first 
Lord's Day of the new year. You can start the year off right because 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Did you hear him? The old is gone, the new is here, but it's dependent on those two words, in Christ, and it'll affect who you are, what you say, what you do, what you give, and what you pray, because those are the five outlets of spiritual power that every single one of us has. Those are the five we're gonna talk about for the next several weeks. And I would encourage you to make that resolution. Don't miss a one. Start the new year off right. Let's pray. Lord, our only hope is you in us. You are our hope of glory. Our only hope is that you're in us and greater are you, the one in us, than the one who's in the world. Our only hope is that you can do more than we imagine or ask and think for the power that you work within us. Our only hope is that your son, Jesus Christ, is in us. That we are crucified with him, nevertheless we live, yet not us, but Christ who lives in us. And the life that we now live in the body, we live by faith in your son who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you for what you have done in 2023. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And we lay this fresh slate of 2024 at your feet. And we ask you to do more than we can ask or imagine by the power that you have working within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Get this new year started off right. We'll see you next week.